This episode is brought to you by LMNT. Healthy hydration isn't just about drinking water, it's about water plus electrolytes. It makes sense, you lose both water and sodium when you sweat. Both need to be replaced to prevent muscle cramps, headaches and energy dips. But most people only replace the water. Why? Well, because since the 1940s we've been told to drink 8 glasses of water per day, thirsty or not. Drinking beyond thirst is a bad idea. It dilutes blood electrolyte levels, especially sodium, which leads to headaches, low energy, cramps, confusion, or even worse. This low sodium situation called hyponatremia is very common amongst endurance athletes, shift workers, and those who work outside in the heat, leading to thermal stress. The solution isn't to stop drinking water, it's to drink water plus electrolytes. This is where LMNT comes in. Just mix this flavor, electrolyte drink mix into your water bottle and you're good to go. It's got no sugar or artificial junk, just electrolytes. LMNT has your electrolyte needs covered. Former research biochemist Rob Wolf and Keto Gains founder Tyler Cartwright and Louis Villasener formulated LMNT to provide the optimal ratios of sodium, potassium and magnesium for health, performance and energy. They also formulated LMNT to please your palate. Many different flavors such as orange salt, citrus salt, watermelon salt and many many more just head over to LMNT to find out or better still go down to the show notes click on the link the sleep for performance link to get the, um, to click on this and get your free promotional pack where you can get a taster pack and no questions asked refund policy as well you don't even need to send it back so check it out at LMNT in the show notes Welcome back to the Sleep for Performance podcast. Today, I'm joined by a fellow Irishman whose name I can pronounce because normally I can't pronounce people's names. We have, it is Dr. Peter Tierney, isn't it? Do you have finished your PhD? It is, yeah. I just don't, I don't really, I don't like, I get fairly uncomfortable when people say doctor because I'm like, oh no, my sister's a medical doctor. I'm like, I leave, leave the title to her. <laughs> did you Did you know, we might have discussed this on the podcast, that technically a medical doctor is an honorary it's title. It, well, it's an really. honor, honorary title and a PhD okay. is actually a full doctor title. There you go. Okay. Now I need. I'm, I I should probably clarify this, but I believe that when you do medicine, that if you stop practicing medicine, you can't be called a doctor, but you can always be called a doctor forever with a PhD. There you go. This is this is going to be uh, next Christmas uh, Christmas dinner conversation and arguments for my family. <laughs> yeah, because it's. I I need to clarify. I I clarify this again. Maybe put in the show notes. But yeah, but people said to me, you only said it because you're a you're a PhD, so you want to do that, <laughs> and that's right. But you know, Peter, I don't like people calling me doctor, and as well, but only for the people who are assholes. Then I say you have to call me doctor. <laughs> so all my family called me doctor. <laughs> <laughs> I made that joke to my mother one time and she didn't like it but anyway. <laughs> so Peter you join us from maybe the the wet one of the wettest places in the world um which we didn't talk about before the podcast um you moved from wet country number one Ireland to wet country number two Vancouver in Canada which I didn't say to you before and probably gets just as much as rain as Ireland yeah second yeah only second only to ireland uh yeah moved moved to vancouver just about a year ago um uh just for a new role and kind of went actually through or via via london i guess uh or the london, UK. Yeah. so yeah, yeah similar enough a little bit warmer there than dublin most of the time anyway <laughs> it, it sounds like maybe you're on one of those um what do you call those um like those uh what would you call them what do you call years ago one of those like uh prisoner ships where they brought people to London and dispersed them out into the different colonies. <laughs> I've been planted in Vancouver. <laughs> convict, convict ships. Yeah, 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 yeah. We brought everybody to Dublin, then we shipped them to London, then we dispersed them to Canada and, and Australia from there on in. <laughs> That's under the new King Charles III. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, Peter, tell us a little bit about where you uh, grew up in Ireland and uh, what was it like going to school and what sports you were into? Yeah, so... Um... Family is living, my folks are living in Wicklow, so County Wicklow, just south of Dublin. Uh, I grew up there, but then I, I, I guess I, I would have referred to Dublin as home just because I've been there since I was 12 years old, since secondary school, right through, through to university. Um, and then when I was working there for about five years after university as well. So um, played, uh, honestly, a bit of everything, like a bit of music, a bit of sport, played I have to say soccer now because I'm on the American continent. <laughs> <laughs> Football, played basketball, um, I swam, yeah, a few different instruments. And then when I went to secondary school in Dublin, um, I, I picked up rugby. 
Yeah. And I was actually very reluctant to try it. And I remember um, just didn't like the idea. I was like, oh, look, I'm just mad into like football, soccer now. And said like, want to keep playing this. But dad was like, look, he went to a rugby school as well. He was like, oh, just give it a go. If you don't like it, you know, do what you want, but just give it a go anyway. Make sure you try it. So I tried it and hockey, um, kind of love rugby then through school. And then um, after, yeah, my undergrad ended up being very fortunate to get an internship opportunity within the university first. Um, and that was a great year of experience, kind of like during the final year of that degree. So I learned a lot doing that. And then from that, got another opportunity with uh, Leinster Rugby and spent five years there as a sports scientist and strength conditioning coach. Um, then went on to England and worked in the FA. So the English FA um, with the men's and women's international teams. And kind of like we were just touching base on before, just like really cool role, mix of sort of like project um and like sports science work but also then like high amount of delivery um and the cadence is really interesting like obviously international camps for set blocks are like all go 100 percent, and then even the weeks before and after that you're kind of building up and down and, and it was it was a really cool role like learned a lot doing it um particularly even just like managing projects and like external consultants and all that like, there was just a lot going on so mm. really really uh cool place to work as as was Leinster um and like fortunate to have a couple of like interesting roles that give, gave me broad experiences um across I guess like strength and conditioning recovery sports science all of the kind of different aspects of some of those performance roles and then yeah just um find myself now in Vancouver in an industry role so a little bit different um than yeah the sort of delivering with teams and being embedded mm. within those kind of like sporting environments but like and yeah, it's been it's been brilliant so far. I've been here about a year. I've been in Canada for yeah, just just over a year. So that uh new role has been challenging, but um definitely now see a lot of like carryover between I guess like ways of working and like experiences that I've had in sport. Um definitely I suppose are hopefully helping me uh in a in an industry based role as well. Yeah. Definitely. I was going I was just laughing at you were saying like going from like Leinster to the FA and then into into a kind of an industry role. At least now you got like your evenings and weekends to yourself again. <laughs> Some <laughs> yeah. normality. <laughs> yeah, that's definitely yeah. yeah. The weekends is um is definitely like you still get used. To, and there's still times, honestly, like I I don't know whether it's like force of habit from previous roles or just maybe the way it worked, but I like there is still times where I'd like if I if I feel like more comfortable getting a bit of work done, like in an evening or I want to catch up on something or a weekend, like I'd still do that. And I feel like yeah. it's not like I'm away from home or whatever else, but there's, so I don't know if, yeah, maybe it's ingrained in me from like the sport, but sometimes like I'll, I'll happily give an evening or two a week. If I, if I know like I'll, I'll I'm more productive, then I'll, yeah. I'll do some work there. And it, so, yeah, maybe. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I think from sport, I, I think a lot of people do that regardless of their background. I, I know a lot of people in professional roles are engineers or, you know, surveyors or geologists or you know management people who do the same thing as well because sometimes you just get that space and it's a bit of quiet and there's less noise but i suppose compared to sport you're not um you know with like Leinster rugby you're not like you know on the road every weekend and dealing with 30 odd kids you know because as you know <laughs> more, you know even better than i do these guys can be quite demanding so for these big burly rugby guys it's kind of interesting how um yeah, some of the questions they ask you like oh can i get a drink of water can i have something where's my phone do you have a charger you know, and yeah. I've done research with, you know, rugby teams and with contact sport athletes at AIS. And it's like, lads, really? Like, look <laughs> at the size of you. Get your shit together. You're yeah. standing there crying, looking for a phone charger. Like, look at you. Come on. We're like, very, just... very lucky. Like, I, 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 like I'd still be uh, good friends with like a lot of the, the guys there. Um, Cause I, like I would have played a bit of room not to their level or anything, but with and against some of them um, through university and, to be, like I have to give credit to like a lot of the guys in there so like a lot of them are relatively like self-sufficient and independent because they've gone through that system so they're very familiar with like exercise and stuff so you're sort of just like tweaking bits but yeah they're <laughs> it one I remember like a former player retired and he kind of said like god I feel like I've just left school but you know I feel like I've been in school for the last 20 years because he went from secondary school into yeah, professional yeah. setting and he's just sort of said you know like I'm in an office and I have to kind of remind myself that I'm in a, you know, a corporate job and, you know, you just get very used to being around with like a lot of good friends in the change yeah, room yeah. and stuff. So it is, a, it is a funny dynamic. Anyway. Yeah. So he wasn't, he wasn't going for his morning tea and coming back naked. Like, was he like thinking he was in the change room? Just <laughs> no, get, no, get no, change. No. Yeah. So Peter, um, coming back to your time, at what university did you go to and what was your undergrad in? 
Uh, so I went to University College Dublin um, and my undergrad was in uh, health and performance science. Uh, so okay. bachelor's there. Um, so that was this sort of like, I use the word like hybrid to describe some of my roles. And I sort of see this degree as like a bit of a hybrid one as well. That was a mix of that sort of like sports science, which you can focus on in other courses. Yeah. And also a bit of like, I guess, like general population, like public health. Mm. And I kind of liked the... Uh, That's interesting, yeah. Yeah, I liked the mix of it because like have that interest in, of course, both of them. Um, And then from there, when I started in Leinster, decided to do a research master's um, in, in UCD as well, because the rugby training ground is, is based in on the campus. Um, so did a research master's um, whilst I was working in Leinster. Um, and then before I did a PhD, I did this all through UCD, but there was a sort of data analytics professional diploma that I did. And uh, I I always say this to everybody, like I'm not a this unbelievable data analyst or like expert, you know, this, or statistician, there's people that are far, far better than I am at that. But one of the things that was apparent to me anyway, when I was like going through as like a strength addiction coach and sports scientist was this sort of like growing need for like being able to understand or at least like translate data mm. that was being collected, whether that was sport and I mean, general population athletes and business, everything. And I guess at the time when I started, I th- I had this sort of idea that, okay, if I wanted to be a person who was like, for example, a head of performance in a sporting organization, I would at least need to be able to communicate efficiently and handle some understanding of um, data stream. So if, for example, you're a head of performance, you had a strength conditioning coach, a sports scientist, a physiotherapist, a nutritionist, you'd also have a data analyst as part of your team or more maybe. And that diploma, I think, just sort of like nudged me that way to say, okay, like I can definitely handle that i could think about it in a good way but i can also speak to people um in that sort of world and that was the sort of idea of doing it and then it also helped me obviously just analyze and um explore and visualize some of my own data for the phd as well so uh did all that through ucd and and um not the advice that i was given but the sort of thought that went through my head was like um i was sort of in like i was working full-time doing that was after the undergrad, but, um, so there's a lot of like late evenings and weekends. So probably similar to the point we were just saying, like you kind of get that embedded into you from doing a PhD while you're working. But, um, somebody said like, look, if, if you have the scope to do it while you're working and do it now, and, you know, at the time, uh, Lencer had, we had some questions we wanted to answer. So it sort of just fell into place like really well that like the timing is really good. But there was another colleague of mine who said, you know, I, I really wish I had done a PhD a couple of years ago, but he said now, like, it's, you know, I'm, I'm a little bit older. I've got other things outside of like that. I just, it's not possible. So um, there was a few conversations I had and got some good advice from people that kind of just went with it, um, dug in and then survived at the other side of it. <laughs> yeah. Well, I don't think you're ever too old. But yeah, there was a woman. No, 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 there. definitely. There not. was a woman, no, the woman no. a few weeks ago. I um, can't, uh, can't remember the story, or the link to the story where it is, but she was in her 80s, maybe 87. And she completed a PhD at Trinity College. And she was looking at the impact of the Harry Potter books on culture something to that effect yeah she was in her late right. 80s yeah so thought, right. there you go never no, oh, I could. Ne- never definitely never too old because i was 37 when i went back to do mine i finished when i was just before i was 40 and i was like ooh, a bit old to do it and I, I did feel old compared to people in their mid-20s that were doing it i did feel old but uh, and in hindsight i actually thought it was perfect timing for me because i was one more mature two i had some finances yeah. behind me and three i was more focused whereas i think it was in my early 20s i probably would have been like you know, drinking and smoking bongs behind the shed, but you know, I, I, not, <laughs> yeah. I, I just thought so, he would have been that focus, but I think sometimes yeah. it is beneficial to be a little bit older. But it's interesting you mentioned you mentioned the diploma in analytics because that's kind of on my scope this year mm-hmm. as something that I want to improve um, in terms of loading, learning coding because obviously people mm-hmm. are just flying ahead like with coding now. And also I have um, a bit of an interest in data visualization and data translation more so like how do we get these messages across to to people and we often will go from working with like a mining company like some days i can go from working with a mining company in the morning to talking to you know a a small transportation company at lunchtime then talking to like an elite sports team in the evening so do you have any kind of um insights or thoughts or reflections on common kind of things that you apply in terms of presenting data to people is there any kind of rules that you have about that rules i do i do think our guides uh, like more so yeah i i do think um even having like as a sports scientist like working in sport i definitely felt that like i could see some i could see um people that were effective at translating 
I guess, like research and data, whether that was strength or condition, whatever type of data it was. I did, there was definitely like, I could notice that some people were uh, better at it than others. And I think that was always something that I tried to like focus a lot of attention on and get a lot better at, like from the get-go when I started working, because at the end of the day, it is one of the most important things. Obviously you need to understand like the quality of research behind the work that's been done. But at the end of the day, if you can't translate it properly to whether it's an athlete or a coach or someone in business now or whatever else, that it, it doesn't matter how good the research is if you can't actually translate it. Um, so I feel like I always like the, I always, yeah, I always like the practical applications part of like when I read a research paper, because to me, it, it shows me like how somebody's thinking. Mm-hmm. And it's not to say that I would ever, I don't, I don't ever copy what somebody writes, but if, for, if, for example, I read a research paper and I, and I read like, okay, Ian, you've written your practical recommendations or applications are this. I always think, okay, is that how I would actually apply what like is found in this paper? And I find sometimes it's like not the same. So like, that's maybe like one, I don't think it's a guy, but it's like one thing that I do is like, I compare what I would do with the paper versus what the authors have, have written. That's like one, I guess, example. And sometimes when there's like a mismatch, I'm like, oh, that's really interesting. Like, why would, why did they recommend that? Like, I would have seen this so differently. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's always one. I think the second one is like, and it's linked to your question is like the visualization of stuff. I like, I do find that, um, maybe it's just the populations I've worked with, but people tend to prefer like the visual um, aspect versus, I say that graphical, sorry, versus um, like too much written text or words for for some reason and like overviews of stuff. And I find that's, um, if you can like, I guess, visualize a lot of information into something condensed that shows, okay, this is like high level of what like this concept is, whether it's an example like sleep like things that improve sleep or things that impact sleep and often um the concern from i think some of some people is that oh like you're not representing all of the the detail or the all the context and stuff behind it but what i find is that anything even that i've shared or presented to like athletes or coaches in the past if you start high level and visualize stuff very well you will always get people that ask you questions of like what they want to know more about so like a stick to that, like sleep example. Okay. Like if I visualize something that has, you know, a few different circles or colors or whatever it is, the things that people are interested in, they will always say, Oh, like, what well, can you explain this more? And I find that like that sticks and lands with people better instead of throwing everything in the wall and just hoping that something sticks because mm-hmm. I think that's quite overwhelming. For people. So I think like to try answer your question without me rambling too much is like, yeah, like always thinking of like how I would apply something, whether that's like if I'm reading a blog or listening to a podcast or reading a paper or even just trialing whatever, like an exercise program with an athlete. Um, and then secondly, like trying to visualize it, whether that's graphical or like video or voice or like, I guess, like podcast kind of based um, and trying to almost like encourage the people you're presenting to ask questions because then you understand like what they're actually interested in and what they need to know more about. Yeah, I think there's a couple of things there that hits home for me. I think you're right about the practical applications. And that's something that I often will, a question I'll ask myself writing a paper or when I'm working with students or working with co-authors, like, what does this mean? But interesting enough, this is something we do in business and in research as well when we're generating data. And I think sometimes as researchers, particularly those people who deep in their PhD or just predominantly have done research, they look at the data and assume that everybody knows what's going on. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. So the first thing I would agree with you on upon is like if you can represent it visually, and this is my PhD supervisor told me, and he was a respirology type, um, respiratory type guy, um, you know, classic kind of sleep medicine guy. He said anywhere, anytime where you can show data in a figure as opposed to a table, do that. And I thought that was a mm-hmm. great rule. And that's going to your point as well. Because yeah. I've had a couple of students where it's cool, what do you think of this paper? And I'm like, you've got like six tables. Yeah, but all the data is in there. Yeah, but where's the figure? Who's going to read that? No, it's going to, what's good, what's bad? Or the p-value. But yeah, yeah but think about some guy living in, I don't know, the middle of Texas who has a slight interest in research and picks up this paper up and access. How is he going to decipher that? But if you have a graph that's up and down, I think that's going to be a little bit easier. And then the other thing as well is like, and you've done this as well with some of your work, whereas you've graphically color-coded them as well, which I really like, which we do a lot in engineering and process flows and and Pareto charts and and data like that. 
where very quickly using kind of traffic light systems, red and green, you can draw people's eye to, oh, that's good, that's bad, which is, I don't think it's used enough in research, by the way. I think we're very yeah. bad at like doing that in presentations or even in publications. We just put up these kind of like gray shaded black and, you know, black yeah. or gray shaded kind of bar charts. But some of the stuff that you do, and one of the examples here you have is on the sleep restriction scenes you're talking about sleep and tennis act, um, accuracy from a paper back in 2013 about caffeine. I think that was, was that Louise? I haven't got the... Uh, I, can't was, remember the author. I think it was Rainer and I think that paper was Rainer and Horn, if memory serves me right, um, from Loughborough University in the UK. That might be the one. I'm nearly yeah. I can't. I can't remember. Nearly, I don't have it. Put me nearly sure. It, I'm nearly sure it is. You don't have the reference in there, so put the reference in, Peter. <laughs> I have. I have the, the DOI, don't I? <laughs> yeah, you have the DOI. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Does the link work? Does the link work for the DOI? Let's let's check. <laughs> No, noting a it's it's funny when when you are looking at it. I'm just taking um, (laughs) when you're when you're looking at it there. The color coding thing is always um interesting to me because it can be really positive and really easy to understand, but it can also sometimes it can be like sort of misleading and and like I guess it's like too simplified. So I'm always like trying to strike the balance between like if I am visualizing something like being I guess like conscious of how people interpret like green is always good and red is always bad um and I guess like even you know about some like there's been some conversation on like wearable technology and stuff now and like like those like green orange reds or green yellow red scores or whatever and like red always being bad and stuff but when you take it in the context of like I don't know for example like a heavy training block or something like it's probably the adaptation that you're seeking mm. to stress yourself and then recover eventually so there's, oh, there's yeah. always things like that but i am always conscious of of like being oversimplified but trying to simplify a lot of stuff as well yeah it's and i think you're right it's always context and the, the example i always keep falling back on which i probably spoke on this podcast and i speak to lots of people about is the sleep latency one which you see a lot with electronic like device studies is you know if it takes you peter you know 12 minutes to fall asleep and it takes me 25 or 20 let's say 25 minutes to fall asleep there might be a statistical difference between that but it's still within normal ranges. So mine mm-hmm. might look like it's bad, and yours might be green because it's lower than mine. But mm-hmm. you know, if you're falling asleep in under 30 minutes, it's still fine. It's not really a problem. Yeah. And also as well, because you fall asleep quicker than me, it doesn't mean that I won't get more sleep than you. You might fall asleep and have more awakenings during the night. So it's all about context. I, I totally agree with you. But I think yeah. if you're drawing people's eye to something really quick, I do like color coding and visualization because what it does do, it gets the person engaged and looking at it and gets the, the conversation yeah. started. And it allows you to unpack the detail and the context, like you said, as opposed to putting up a table there with 15 lines, you know, mm-hmm. and six columns. And you've got p-values in there and adjusted and post hoc and effect size. And people are looking at it going, what is this guy on about? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And and like even to the point around like get people diving in. Like if somebody sees something green, for example, they're like, oh, I didn't like, oh, that's caught my eye. Like, why is that green? Like I find some of the stuff that I post on social media, I find it really good. Like I get like, there's some stuff that I put out as like a, I'm just, here's something I thought and put together in a few minutes. Like here, will somebody help me? Like, what have I, what have I left out or forgotten? Or like, would you change mm-hmm. anything? And like, honestly, it gets such good feedback and input from like different platforms that like the end result of a graph or something that I've summarized isn't all me it's it's actually like me and then a lot of people that have input different um like a lot of other people that who are like yeah that have far greater knowledge than i do have sort of input to it so at the end of the day those like some of those figures and stuff are actually it's i've made them but a lot of other people have actually put in expertise and knowledge and opinion into those graphs as well yeah i think that's a that's a key thing that i always say as well is about i don't think there's I think there's very little original thought and research because it's hard to decipher in your own mind what mm. what all your inputs are in your body of knowledge before you come up with a new idea. I just constantly look at it as like grains of sand into a bottle. We're just constantly moving it up along and we're, we're constantly making it better. Because I know I, sometimes I have these like, what I think are these like revolutionary thoughts and how I'm going to approach something. I think then about two days later, I'm like, oh yeah, actually I heard that about seven years ago. All right. <laughs> yeah. That's something I borrowed from here. Or that's something I yeah. spoke to this guy. That's something I read about this. And so you're constantly building upon that. So, you know, you're constantly in this forward momentum. And then I think you're right as well. The other thing is all those people that are piling in and helping you with it as well. And I think I heard this on a podcast yesterday, actually, a guy called um, Chris Williams, I think, or Williamson, the Wisdom Podcast or something like that. Anyway, he said, you know, basically his measure of an expert is 
when so, when they tell you it's this, however, or it depends, or in addition. Mm-hmm. So then, w- when people give you the black and white answer, they're generally not an expert. But when people are giving you all the caveats and the info, like what George is saying, that's mm-hmm. the people that are true experts because they know how complex everything is. Yeah, and infinite shades of gray. It's hard to get black and white, isn't it? Exactly, it's impossible, (laughs) and it's so infuriating. And I remember like doing some radio here a few years ago, and the guy said to me afterwards, he goes, "Oh man, you guys drive me fucking mad." He went like on this, like the ABC was like the equivalent of BBC. This was just afterwards. I said, "I said why?" And he was laughing. He goes, "Because you never give a straight answer. It's always like it depends." I said, "Man, there's never is one answer." Because it's so (laughs) infuriating just for like a normal person asking a question. I said, "But if I give you the black and white answer," I said. And it didn't work. Then people are going to think I'm an idiot. Like it just yeah. it doesn't work like that. It, it it just can't. There's always going to be. It depends. Or we need further. And yeah, mm-hmm. every study is going to have it. it. Needs further research. And it's all in context yeah. as well. Yeah, you know? it, it that it is like. But even striking that balance is actually a challenge. And I found that in like both sport and in industry, it's people when they ask you questions as a researcher, they do want they do want you to give. Um, not like concrete recommendations but they want to sort of like back a decision and yeah. I think like there's there's definitely a balance between always like falling back on it depends or like those those like context things and even there's some meetings that I've had um, and I've said to like if it's a group of research I've said okay like we if we're trying to look for some conclusions or recommendations at the back of this we need to bring those together and have that discussion but no one's allowed to say it depends you have to give me some like something like tangible that someone can go away and say okay we're gonna Mm. implement this program or we're gonna make this or whatever it is and if it doesn't work we can come back and address why it didn't work but like to just go with it because i do find whether it's like an athlete or coach or someone else who's not a researcher always is looking for something so i'm always very like aware of provide yeah it's like the balance of providing Mm. like enough context and enough like not like wiggle room but i also want to make sure that okay i'm just going to back a decision based on all those contexts without me having to like verbalize them or visualize them and then yeah so it's that's a tricky one i think yeah it is and but i think also having the what do my friend say karen from cork he said um the um was it the epistemic epistemic Humility is the word I think he used. Correct. I've heard that phrase before. Yeah, I think that's for epistemic humility. I might have to, to come back and say that you are wrong. And I thought, oh, yeah. that actually is a good way. Like you're not too married to your outcomes of it. And I think when researchers or scientists or people like that are married to it, and what you're saying there, Peter, is basically, yeah, come back now and address why it didn't work or what went on. Mm. Let's not get sort of married to the outcome but let's get married mm. to the process of reviewing it and moving forward. A bit like what we see in, you know, management philosophy around like plan, do, check, act, you know, or in Kaizen and improvement, what we see in Japanese philosophy mm. and management, basically want to make things better and let's not yeah. attack the person around that or what they said, but let's kind of more mm. attack the process and make it better as we move forward. Yeah. And I think that's- Because I think like- it needs to be. Yeah, at, at the time, if somebody asked me a question, if I give an answer and say, like, look, this, this is what I recommend, or this is what I think, at the time, that's right. Now, in two years' time, if you ask me the same question, <laughs> I might have learned something else, yeah, or like yeah. something might have dis- So I might have changed my opinion, but there's like neither one is wrong, I guess, is, is how I would think about it. Yeah. And I think as well, like, I have the very same thing. I had this conversation last week with some of my fellow researchers at UWA. Uh, I said, if I had to do my PhD again, and if I had more money, obviously funding, which is obviously always an issue, I would do it completely the opposite way. And they're like, what do you mean? And I just basically outlined what I would do. And I was like, that's the way I would do it. But sometimes you have to start at a certain point where you get the hook as well. I think, Mm -hmm. you know, if you're dealing with a team or in a sport or a new area, you might have your perfect process you want to do with athletes to to pre-screen them and take blood work and put them in labs and do all that. But sometimes actually you might just want to get some, you know, very quick self-assessment measures and some group interventions and it might be, you know, a very observational, very kind of maybe poor study in terms of what you're doing. But what it does do is gets engagement across the whole team and the staff. And that's invaluable to do that. So it might be a very poor study, which you publish maybe in a in a lower down sort of impact factor journal. 
And it mightn't be great on your resume, but what it does do is get you lots of buy-in with people as well. And I think what happens sometimes with some researchers, they want to chase like the perfect scenario of their of the research protocol. They want to have a design perfectly. They want to have all the funding. They want all the athletes to act like robots. And because then they want to publish in like BJSM top journal and get like heaps of citations. And then they have a panic attack like trying to do that. Whereas opposed, sometimes you gotta again come back to what you're saying, you gotta strike that balance, which is mm-hmm. which is hard. And I think it's not just in sports, I think it's in it's in anybody doing support type roles in any industry, whether you're in a health and safety role, a HR, a finance role, um, environment, or any of these type of sort of roles in a matrix organization. It's very difficult. And you have to kind of yeah. strike that balance between buy-in and practicality as well. So but it was always evident to me, and it still is now in, in sport and industry, is that there's so much work, like really good work, that doesn't get published. Mm. And that's not to say that it isn't something that you can make decisions on. Even like think back to sport, there were things like that we pilot tested or we collected information on, but never wrote like a formal publication. And is that to say that what we did wasn't based on science? Like definitely not, because it was based on like in-house information on like a specific population, you know, it, it probably was good enough some things to be published, but there's other constraints like time and everything else that you just never get around to. So I think that's always, that's very evident to me in that, you know, a lot of decisions you make or like information that you share may not be like published in an article or in a, in a very strong journal. It might be just some, something that you've collected yourself, but that doesn't, that doesn't take away from how valuable it is. I, I would totally agree with you, Peter. And I'd also go as far to say that in some industries, they could be five to 10 years behind the research. Now, some yeah. people listen to this be like, what do you mean? Doesn't research inform practice? Not always. And the challenge yeah. is that research and research institutions move too slow for industry. And I see this a lot, not just when, when academic institutions engage with industry or even people come out of academia and engage with industry. Mm-hmm. The pace of industry is too much for them. They don't get down into the weeds of the detail. They're constantly moving forward. It's an 80 20 rule. And they're like ahead of the game. And I would say, like, for a lot of the work we do in mining, oil, and gas, I would say, in terms of fatigue risk management, fitness for work, at least five years behind the research is behind behind what industry is doing. And industry have got no interest in publishing. They're like, Mm -hmm. we got a problem. We want to solve that. And it needs to be done in two weeks. Now, if you stop that project, went, let's write a paper. Let's go to the yeah. let's go to the university and submit an ethics application, which can take between two to six months. Mm. And because they're paid employees that you're working with, then the ethics board like has a heart attack about, ooh, mm. what if they lose their jobs? And what if there's a perceived conflict and blah, blah, blah. By the time you get the ethics application through, it's done. And secondly, <laughs> people don't want to, a lot of industry don't want to deal with in- academic institutions in terms of funding them or giving them money or funding their research when they can get the same outcome in two weeks from a consultant that can move at the pace they want them. Which goes to your <laughs> point is like, you know. The example I have of this is in, in my time in rugby, <clears throat> when I was uh, researching at the same time, um, there was like, I guess like a, there were some findings that we had from the data that we had and we had, um, I guess like implemented some like specific training based off of that. And we, I mean, hopefully it had a positive impact. It's it's obvious because there's so many other factors, it's hard to, to be sure that that's a specific one, but hopefully it had a positive impact on whether that was like physical performance or like match performance. But I think about two years, maybe two and a half years later, um, the data that we had analyzed was published. Um, and I remember like people reaching out to me after publication saying like, oh, hey, so you published this on like whatever. Um, I'd love to chat to you about how you're applying it. And I was like, I'm yeah, more than happy to chat. But I was like, but to be honest, like we've kind of moved on from this. Like we've done that for two and a half years. We had great success with it from a training perspective. But we've now found like other things that we've shifted our little like, our training like routine yeah. towards something else. So I can chat to you about what we have done, but like currently we're not using what you're what you're asking. So I just yeah. thought it was a really good example of like we were two years ahead of what we had published ourselves and we just sort of moved on to the next thing based on the squad and stuff that we had. So mm-hmm. people were then sort of looking at like that sort of like training style, I guess. Yeah. So coming back to some of your research, Peter, and um, what was the focus of your PhD research? What, what was your topic? What were you interested in? So my PhD focused on, um, I, in a, in a broad sense, like trying to maximize performance in rugby union using like a sports science approach. And it was an applied sports science approach. So 
the story i guess which is like i think the challenging part in, in some phds is to make sure everything is like connected and then has like that direct impact because sports science is quite a broad field as well it's like it, you know you could put everything into that bucket but um for me anyway like the process of the phd and the flow of the phd would sort of mimic how i would approach say going into a, a role as a sports scientist and it started with trying to understand some uh key performance indicators from uh the sport off the back of that then it was trying to look at measures to uh, sorry uh methods to measure um some of those key performance indicators and then it looked at um differentiating between different competition levels and trying to build strategies around how we could actually impact those um so that was the sort of phd and when i um did my viva and like shared and i've spoken on it before this wasn't part of the phd because this isn't uh, like it's like another thesis in itself or like another just a way of working but in theory then um when we implemented that like sort of those like training protocols or like exercise protocols you in theory should be able to go backwards almost and say okay like we've we've implemented this did it have an impact on what we were measuring and then did that impact those key performance indicators yeah, in sport? Yeah. so um that was sort of it in like a that's my vibe and like what a 30 second uh 30 second uh window there but um focused around i guess like some gym and microsensor uh data so we use like gps technology we were collecting some other measures in um in the gym as well and then some like rugby specific uh like video coded key performance indicators yeah that's very interesting that's a very similar approach actually to engineering stuff so when you look at data as well when you apply what we would call like containments or countermeasures or containments for the short term or countermeasures long term is then measuring those over time to see if they actually positively influence those key performance indicators which are basically the health indicators of the business really mm -hmm. and it's sort of we don't keep them in the green or whatever it might be or reduce the variability the business isn't mm -hmm. going to operate you know so what's the key things that you that you need to do so very interesting that it has some yeah. overlap with that so yeah. rugby is a very complex sport a lot of people just think it's brutes running up and down the field and maybe there's an argument that in rugby league it's like that <laughs> um but I don't know, know enough about rugby league, but I do know a lot about rugby union. But in rugby union, you got 15 people on a pitch playing against 15 other people, and each position is quite different. And then mm -hmm. you can broadly break those positions out into two groups, being backs and forwards, and the backs being sort of smaller, although not that small, but smaller and generally more agile and quicker. And the forwards then generally being larger, either the width of them or the height of them. Um, and not as fast as the back. So in a kind of a general basic layman's characterization of the two of them. And each of those roles then within those groups are very different. So how difficult is it to look at key performance indicators in a team where one, all those roles are so variable and two, the style that the team plays as well, because there's different styles of rugby. Like, you, you know, you've got teams that play like a kind of a, one to 10 game where the, the forwards and just out to the out half and it's very much kept in that zone. Then you've got other teams that like to run it wide. And then you've got other teams that basically punch up the middle and kind of rock and drive through and there's all these different strategies. So how how hard is it to look at KPIs for a team based upon all those different variables and then players coming in and out and so on? If it, yeah, I mean, even the way I've described it before is that like there's, it's like the once the one team, but there are like there are people on the pitch playing different sports like, yeah that's exactly you, right yeah if, if you swap you know like a, a tighter prop with a an out half is like you know they're playing you know you could be a world class like the best in your position in one and you could be the worst in, in another position just because of the, the different roles so like that's always like a, 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 a funny way to like think about it i think at the end of the day um yes like an individual player individual players obviously have massive contribution but it is at the end of the day a team sport that is reliant on like how well your team performs um and i guess like in my head this isn't to say like it isn't but when you think of like even nba you think about how much of a difference one player makes like one player yes, can literally yeah. change a, a team so much now it's still an important team sport and of course that there's like so much like tactics and everything else to it. so I, i'm i'm definitely not saying that like it isn't but I don't think rugby is as extreme as that in terms of like having one player. Like I don't think one player can make that type of a an impact or that much. Now, certain players can have a huge impact, but it's also they're reliant on other players around them. So I think the key performance indicators are one, but when we looked at them anyway, one, it's um competition specific as well. Um, 
So the approaches to, and I'll use like Northern Hemisphere competitions just because that's where I've sort of lived. Um, the difference between like an international competition or fixtures versus a European cup versus a domestic league. Um, the tactics that teams will use might be different in those competitions. And as a result, then key performance indicators are different. And then as a result, um, like the training um, stimulus or like the workload or load placed on players is also different. And how you then um, like prepare players for those and also help players recover from those different competitions is definitely the challenge. <clears throat> and the example, uh, one of the papers that I published in the PhD was characterizing different competition levels. So it was literally this paper. So in the Northern Hemisphere, we had a British and Irish Cup. Um, we had uh, the Pro 14 or like the domestic competition. It's changed name now a good few times. Uh, the European Cup and then international rugby. And it wouldn't be uncommon for a player to play across obviously all three of those competitions. I think in one year we had one, two players who played across four because they were coming back from injury yeah. and then played British and Irish Cup, domestic, European and international. But the physical demands and tactical demands are so different across those competitions. So one of the biggest challenges was one, like how do you prepare a player for an international fixture, which is a much slower game. And I say this from like a distance perspective, but has a huge um, collision aspect, like a much greater collision aspect than a domestic game. And when a player goes from playing two domestic games, two European games, two international games, back to a domestic game, how do you, how do you navigate a player being exposed to like a completely different stimulus, not a completely different, but a very different stimulus in the space of every two weeks. And how do you physically prepare, mentally prepare, but also how do you help an athlete recover? And that was, um, I guess, a big part of like the PhD in trying to understand and unpick what those like transitions look like and then trying to, I guess, like support athletes in, in the best way possible who are going between those competitions. Hmm. Now, Obviously, this is a the title of this podcast is Sleep for Performance. And so sort of, I'm interested in those kind of when you're talking about recovery, what sort of percentage or what weighting would you give towards sleep and how how you know I suppose how impactful was that with these players given the fact that they're playing a contact sport and some of the research I've done, lots of caffeine use, evening games, high stimulus, very similar to combat sports, um, a lot of sort of I would say pain or discomfort while sleeping after a game as well and even the next day so how, how important was sleep as part of that whole process about that recovery and getting people ready for the next game huge and i'll speak about rugby and football or soccer in in this answer as well because i have the experience in there as well i think um it, one of the things with like <laughs> with sleep is that like the people that you expect to have like I guess when I say the best sleep, like the most consistent schedules and the and the highest quality of sleep, you ex people expect it to be in elite athletes, but often it's not the case. Mm. And it's not to say that they have bad sleep um, behaviors or protocols, but um, it's more so dictated around like competition. And sometimes it's actually impossible for an athlete to maintain a sleep schedule because of travel and late competition fixtures and like you said, uh, caffeine and like modulating caffeine intake. And even I think about like in football, there's there's international travel and you, you play three games in six or sorry, in seven or eight days. And you have a kickoff that, you know, in some underage competitions, we had a kickoff um, that was 10 a.m. Two days later, it was 1 p.m. And then three days later, it was like 8 p.m. or 7 p.m. or something. So you go from such variable things. So it's impossible to keep um, like those like strict schedules. I think for sleep, like one of the things um that i uh, that seems to resonate with athletes is that if they have one like late night sleep after a game or a fixture that it's not the end of the world and i think when you see and i'm going to tie in some recovery stuff to this answer to um try explain it well but when you see a lot of like additional recovery strategies that elite athletes use um i think in their case they actually are essential um in most of general population you know, there's some strategies and additional things that, you know, are more expensive and you don't necessarily have to do because yeah. sleep is accounting for loads of those. But in a case where you've got a pro rugby player or a football player or anything or any athlete who gets to sleep after competition at 3 or 4 a.m., and that's the time when they should have the most sleep to help them recover from the biggest stressors they have all week. 
Um, they're the instances where I think some of the additional recovery strategies like cold water, water, like massage, um, like all the massage, like all those little tools can help. Um, but I think if, I guess in like a non-elite athlete, I think like, you know, the 80, 90% of it can be sort of, not maybe not 80, 90% of recovery anyway, um, can be supported by sleep. Um, and certainly you, you see like really strong relationships between um, athletes sleep and how much energy they have and how much motivation they have to train and how much intent they can provide in in like gym sessions and training sessions so that's certainly um i mean that's what i guess the evidence suggests in the research but also just from anecdote and conversations and um being in and around players like when when people are sleeping well or when people aren't energized and you start to have conversations with them about why mm. um it often does resort back to i guess people saying oh yeah i was kept up you know, my kid kept me up last night or something happened and you start to notice those like reoccurring things of of uh, like sleep issues so yeah to go back to your question in a, <laughs> a long answer uh definitely is a big a big factor to helping players recover but it is i i do think at that elite level particularly for some of those like collision-based sports where you have such high impacts and muscle damage i think you do need some additional strategies on top of on top of sleep as well yeah, I th- I think I think you're right. I think in that combat sports and contact sports where I did my PhD working around sleep, I think having the next day after a competition, I think it's basically a waste of time saying to people, you know, oh, you've had a game. And like you said, Peter, and I think we've shown this in our research and other people too, that basically athletes, if they play an evening game, aren't getting to sleep till about half two, three o'clock in the morning. Mm-hmm. And then what you see then is teams basically going right in at seven for recovery. Like so it's the worst thing you can do is like bringing everybody together as a team for like cold water immersion massage and all that yeah that's great bring them together but maybe do it at lunchtime or at least allow them give them the opportunity to kind of relax the next morning because if they do fall asleep they're probably going to wake up because their habitual wake time is like 7 or 8 a.m but if you're giving them more opportunity they might wake up relax and might even fall back and have a little bit more sleep but again it's it's all those additional things that we're giving them that little bit of downtime if possible um the um the the, exa- the other example I have of, of that is in international football or international sports, when you're away, and it does happen to some extent, um, if you're traveling for a period, you know, for a couple of away fixtures, um, like I guess super rugby example, like if you're if you're in if you're coming from Australia, you've gone to New Zealand for a couple of weeks, um, where you're actually with athletes for that entire time. So you do have opportunity to do things with them that you mightn't have. Um, in a club setting where athletes mm. go home after a game. So there it, there definitely are differences. And I think one of the biggest challenges, particularly from my experience in football, is like scheduling that. And like I think that's where things like profiling and like I guess when I say profiling, I mean like a, a questionnaire, understanding athletes' preferences, like are they a morning or an evening type? And then trying to have conversations with other staff, like coaches, physios, doctors around that. Um, because often, I mean, normal distribution speaks for itself, but you'll find in a squad of 24 footballers that, you know, eight of them are morning people, eight of them are evening people, and eight of them have no preference. And that's like, so how do you schedule a day of recovery for a squad that half of them want to get up in the morning, half of them want to get up in the evening to do recovery, and then the coach wants you to like train as well on that day. So I think giving athletes like choice um, in some of those like, additional recovery strategies like yeah and hopefully maybe like a nap opportunity if it is the case of an elite athlete um but you have to actually like ask those questions um you have to understand like what type of athletes you're working with before you can actually make those decisions in an informed way i think that's a great point because that's one of the things i said i would do different in my phd i think too often in the sports world and even in sleep as well we tend to apply employ this um employ this group intervention or group approach to everybody and like have these, you know, kind of whitewash everybody with the same group as opposed to looking at one individual preferences around sleep and wake activity, like you said, around, you know, your chronotype. And the other thing I'd say as well, Peter, is sometimes preferences don't line up with biological, um, you know, sort of internal rhythm. So people might be truly an even type, but to prefer, they prefer to be a morning type because they think that's the great thing to do because they listen to a podcast mm-hmm. or because, you know, their wife or their husband or their parents told them they were lazy. So they would like, they would prefer to be more of a morning type. But, and sometimes we can see that when you start collecting actigraphy data and you start looking at mid sleep, you go, an actual fact, they're completely off. And we found actually in a study looking at master swimmers where 
they all said there were definite morning types. They were all actually intermediate types. Only one was moderate morning. But what the yeah. what the, what they did like doing was getting up in the morning and swimming and having their training done for their day. They they thought that when they got up early in the morning that they had enough sleep the night before, but they didn't. And then they mm-hmm. then they thought they thought that when they trained at night time, that then they couldn't sleep. But in actual fact, after evening sessions, they actually got more sleep. So it's really yeah. interesting to look at kind of what what they <clears> thought <throat> and what they actually were. So that, that's the first thing. But I think, yeah, I would definitely engage them more. And the second thing I would do was do more individualized work with athletes in terms of like screening them for sleep disorders and um, mm-hmm. using, you know, validated questionnaires first to kind of, I suppose, like um, use it as a risk factor to come down and say, right, well, look, Peter, you've, you know, flagged up on lots of these different questionnaires that have been at risk. We need to do some further testing with you. And then applying treatment there as well. Because coming back to your point about, a lot of people think elite athletes because they're fit and healthy. Well, let me say they're fit. They may not necessarily be healthy because they're mm-hmm. very fit and they're optimized for that sport that have perfect sleep and they're perfect everything. In actual fact, I would say that from the work I've done in shift workers at general population and in elite athletes, elite athletes will be the worst sleepers. Really? Okay, yeah. yeah. From I mean, I mean you definitely groups. have some like variation, yeah, in, in some athletes and when you say about like, I guess the individualization of stuff, there were a couple of things in the FA and like, again, this is not just me. Like this is, I guess, credit to the whole department there on, on some of the work we did around like sleep and recovery. Um, we did try to one, um, understand through questionnaires, I guess, like sleep profiles and behaviors of athletes. Um, and even from a recovery perspective, try to give athletes, um, some like choice and I guess like provide with like decision trees so like if you feel this sort of way like here are some options that lend themselves to support you recovering from this if you feel a different way if you feel tired here are other strategies and there's obviously some overlap but at least for them if we educated them properly on okay when you do this type of recovery intervention it supports this type of um I guess like soreness or fatigue or whatever it is so that was like two things um one of the ways actually was in how I approached the sort of sleep um, stuff was athletes always, um, athletes, I think like will be pretty honest and in terms of like, maybe, maybe there's a little bit of like bias. So they're like, Oh yeah, I want to get this training done in the morning. But um, one of the things we did was like ask questionnaires of both athletes and coaches and, and support staff. And I found that when support staff, particularly like technical coaches, so like, in this example football coaches when they were also questioned about their sleep and we sort of had those discussions with players Mm. and staff it became a much more open conversation around like sleep and training and then what you found or what the hope was was that instead of it just being me talking about like sleep hygiene and recovery and everything else that actually like when the coaches were chatting maybe one-on-one to players they if they would start to notice if they feel tired or other things and then they have conversations about sleep so you sort of it's like easy to think always about like in a sporting example always think about the athlete but sometimes if you engage the coaches and like support staff you actually inherently support the athletes more and then when you start to make suggestions around like training schedules <clears throat> instead of a coach saying oh yeah we're gonna have a morning session if they're if they've been asked the questions they've been shared back the information about themselves and the players and the whole group is, you know, hates getting up in the morning. Well, then even before you have a conversation with the coach, they start to think, okay, like maybe let's start the day a little bit later because mm-hmm. I don't want to get up. Yeah. And I know none of these players want to get up as well. So that was like one of the interesting like kind of tactics we tried to use anyway. Well, I, I, yeah, if I had, if I didn't know Peter, I would say that you and I had set up this conversation beforehand because that's exactly what we did in one of our studies that put elite basketball, female basketball mm-hmm. here in Perth with the Perth Lynx. And as you know, our basketball teams are quite small. So we had like 11 or 12 ba- female basketball players and we had uh, three coaches because we wanted to have that kind of the very same thing. And they went through the same intervention, the same application. So the whole lot, they went through basically 40 odd nights of collecting data using wearable technology. We did a group education session and then we did 20 minute individual consultations with each person to go through their data. And then we assessed them in the post intervention period. Now, in the pre-intervention period or the baseline, the female athletes who generally only train after 12 o'clock as a team between 12 and 5 in the evening, their average sleep was 8.1 hours. So they're the best right. group I've ever seen mm. for two yeah. reasons. One, I don't know, maybe because they're female or less hyped up. 
Um, I think maybe the absence of a contact or combat sport where I've predominantly done research in. So one day, I think it was time of day of training. Two, they were quite they were quite young and quite focused. And I think there wasn't as many, I think as well, outside the research, there's not as many distractions with that female team as opposed to the male male teams in basketball or rugby where they don't have as much, I think, focus from the general population, which is a bad mm. thing in terms of pay and so on. But I think in terms yeah. of sleep, it's a good thing. The second thing then is the coaches had it, we're getting about six to 6.3 hours of sleep before the intervention. And it was to your point exactly, Peter, because what they were doing was they were getting up at six o'clock in the morning, trying to basically cram in a full day before they went to the coaching sessions in the afternoon. And we were saying, it's like you guys got two jobs. Look at what's happening. Plus, look at all these other poor sleep behaviors that you're doing because you're basically like working from seven in the morning to like 12, doing coaching. And then you're going back and you're, and you're doing emails like nine or 10 o'clock at night. And those guys had massive improvements. They went up to like seven and a half, seven forty-five, like over an hour of sleep per night or something for those guys. Right. It was absolutely phenomenal. I think sometimes mm -hmm. if you can get the benefit into those coaches and trainers, it's just as good because they're the ones making the decisions about the yeah. direction of the team, which is like management and leadership people in businesses who are often more sleep deprived than shift workers, for example. And they're banging on about the shift workers being at risk. And the leaders are more at risk sometimes because they're making financial decisions, business decisions. And if they're not well rested, they're not cognitively engaged. And therefore, then they can affect the strategic direction of the team. So I think it's just as important both in both aspects. And we definitely found that. Definitely. Yeah. And like that was that was one of the arguments we had, not arguments, one of the points we had to the coach and saying like, you know, you still have to recover from a, a match that's like an enormous like stress and cognitive load. Like you're not physically doing anything. Like you're not a player. But if you're a coach, if you're a head coach on the sideline of a rugby or a football game or any sport, like there's a huge, like it's a hugely stressful event for you. And mm -hmm. even some of the, some of the coaches that we did um, <clears throat> the questionnaire with, like it was really revealing to them. They they sort of looked at themselves with some of the numbers and were like, wow, like I'm really not looking after myself here. And it was like pretty eye opening for them as well. But, and then hopefully one, I mean, more, most importantly, hopefully we've actually impacted someone's health to a, in a positive way, you yeah, know, like yeah. irrespective of the whole, like if it's for the athletes to play, like yeah. hopefully one, you've actually made a positive improvement. And in, in your case, you've said, you've made some positive shifts and they've made some behaviors that they've increased their sleep by, you know, over an hour a night, which is brilliant. Mm. And then secondly, second to that, yeah, they've, if they're making decisions and they're supporting athletes, or if it's in a business context, like to context, like other staff that they're managing, well, like they're in a good headspace and in good health to actually make those decisions and support other people. So, you know, that old like, cliche saying, like you can't pour from an empty cup or whatever, you know, like it, it is that kind of, that kind of mindset with them um, with sleep mm. um peter you're obviously like in an industry role now and you're obviously very passionate about research and you publish some work are you going to continue to do any sort of research work as an adjunct or collaboration and publish and have you got any aspirations to keep your kind of uh your finger in the pie or have you had enough <laughs> but i know some people just go i'm never doing that again i've seen i've seen a new number of people going i'm getting an industry job but i'm never going inside university again i'm like oh okay <laughs> uh no no always, i don't i'm always open to to like doing research collaborating on research and stuff and i've done a couple of bits again maybe not the last um the last few months just because i've been so busy um in in the role but um yeah definitely always open to particularly around like yeah some of the things that i have i guess like experience and passions in um from a sporting perspective like anything around like kind of sports science and recovery and sleep side of things um and even just i guess specifically in rugby and and football as well like always always would be happy to there's a couple of um like bits uh there's one project that hasn't kicked off yet that um around like i guess like the recovery side and, and some of the wearables um and then there's been one or two in rugby specifically as well but yeah like always always definitely will and it's not no i definitely haven't um sort of wiped my hands with <laughs> with like i guess like publishing or research at all um but it, w it won't be on i guess like current work stuff it'll be on sort of like that um sleep recovery and yeah, yeah. sort of like fitness and health side of things yeah yeah i know a few people actually finished their phds and then burnt their thesis <laughs> they were that sort of like know. you know i'm like man why did you even bother finish that like if you're if you were that stressed out why bother I, one guy said because my parents <laughs> wanted me to do it. i was like wow that's uh, no. yeah i'm like yeah. to me to me it was like it was it was the training wheels to just doing more of it it's i think it's i think it's the last thing i would drop i think I, i'm hoping to be researching until the day i, I absolutely love it yeah. if money wasn't an issue i would just 
do it the whole time. I think it's I think it's <laughs> yeah. it's uh, it's it's great, you know. I definitely won't be burning my um I won't be burning my thesis anyway because even I like you know I got it obviously printed out but it's really interesting um looking at like my undergrad thesis the masters and um the PhD and even like when I look at that I'm thinking like oh like the just how I like would visualize or represent or summarize something it just has improved so much from from undergraduate to masters and even looking at my master's thesis I'm thinking oh my god like I would do that so much better. Yeah, and I, yeah. and, you know, like so. It's nice to see. I'm not. I don't. I don't sit down and read it. <laughs> Obviously, since I finished it, but it's nice to see. Like, it's like you know, if you if you try think about have you progressed or anything, or have you gotten better or something. When you see your undergrad thesis versus your PhD thesis printed out, yeah. and you even just flick through the pages, you can see like, wow, like the the difference is unbelievable. So I think people sometimes think about like a PhD is you have like you obviously develop expertise in a specific area that's a, like a given but to me like doing the phd there's so many skills that you learn and things that you do during it that aren't i guess like domain specific in terms oh, of like 100%, that, yeah. you know absolute yeah, yeah. knowledge so yeah. to me doing like the process of doing the phd obviously there's times when it's very busy and there's times when i did nothing and i was like oh so i have to catch up on stuff but more so around like I guess like the vision of how, what you have to create and like the story you have to tell, how you have to visualize things, how you have to connect different research, how you have to summarize a lot of stuff in in a succinct way. Even just getting through, like being able to like read and like analyze different papers or mm-hmm. like sources of information, blah. Like there's just so many different skills that you learn from doing it. So no, I definitely won't be burning my PhD. I had some, <laughs> I had some good experiences doing it. <laughs> yeah, I um, I think I published my first my first first author paper in 2015 and I read it um last year and I was just like oh, oh, oh like that and at the time like you know I think I did like 20 versions before I submitted and at the time I thought like you know version two was perfect you know and I saw that and sort of you know couldn't understand why it hadn't been published elsewhere and I was and now I read it read it and I'm like oh it's like a primary school like has written it you know like a primary school kid and so just changed so much but again, it's a process and you learn and you keep growing and evolving. And um, on that point point about all the different skills you learn, I would love to do an experiment um, where I actually would take a PhD from one like the health sciences like us, we'll say our sports or sleep or one of these areas and put us into a different domain and see if we could actually publish a paper within in a year. Yeah. So like, like I mean, pop you in engineering or physics or something and see, do those skills actually apply because I think to do, I think I think you learn so many other skills that are not, you know, domain specific. Yeah, de- definitely. And it, like, I think if depending on how you, I guess, like have experienced a PhD, I think you should be able to do that. Now, mm. you'd need some like a domain expertise, I guess, to to do something like that with you. But I, I don't see why you couldn't. And I guess like that was even <clears throat> some of the challenges and the excitement around like going from a sport to an industry role now. Like I still love sport and still speak with a lot of different coaches and organizations and athletes like in, like outside of my current role but um one of the challenges and the excitements about going from sport to an industry role is like okay like what have i learned in a sporting context with a phd what have i like how can i translate some of those skills to an industry role and like I'm enjoying it. Hopefully it's going well. I'm not going to, I'm not going to judge myself <laughs> if I'm doing a good job or not, but like, hopefully that's going well. And like, that's sort of not the same, but like the example of where you're saying, like, could it, could you go from a PhD in health sciences and write an engineering paper? For me, it's like, can I go from experiences in an elite sporting environment to different sports with male and female athletes? And now can I go to an industry role and, and, have success there so mm. that's pretty uh challenging and and like exciting as well so one of the reasons for for uh experiencing something different yeah i'll tell you about my challenge off here <laughs> uh, peter just finally you are very active on linkedin and twitter and you're doing lots of these kind of little cool i, I don't know if you would call them infographs or you know little sort of things that you do um you know, like one here, like recently you put up was like positive and negative contributors to mortality risk. We spoke about the tennis one, you know, you had reduced mortality risk. So basically things in the green that you could do on the red then was like, you know, things you could, that would basically increase your mortality risk or make you sicker, like smoking, excessive alcohol and sun exposure and so on. Is this something you're going to kind of keep doing and build upon? Have you got a website? Um, Is there, are you, are you 
are you kind of open to people asking you questions and you create information about it? What's what's your goal with this type of work? De- definitely, yeah. I, I don't have a website. I just I'm on yeah, like you said, Twitter, Instagram, and and LinkedIn. Um, I think like one of the things. Honestly, like one of the things I get, I learn a lot from posting stuff myself. And I think we were chatting with it before, like, you know, I'll post something and then people will be like, hey, you forgot this. Or like, what about this? And I'm like, oh, yeah, that's like, just I didn't even think of that. Or like, I actually, that's a great point. I forgot mm-hmm. about putting that in. So I get a lot personally from posting stuff. Um, And two, I think like, hopefully, I mean, there's so much like, I don't want to say misinformation. There's so much like stuff and information online. And sometimes I find it's like, even just speaking to like friends and and like anyone who they'll say oh yeah i heard this thing online and i'm like mm. oh, well like that's not like, really true or like there's if it's maybe like i guess when we talked about like translating stuff like someone hasn't translated that properly to you and it's been taken like we said like out of context yeah, yeah. or things like that so i think like part of me doing <coughs> it like one i just yeah like i learn a lot i have a passion in that sort of area like health like I said, even the undergrad, like having, I guess, like dual like interest in both health and I guess like performance. So like both sides of, of that. And I think it was just about, okay, like I feel like through the years of working in like sport and the PhD and now working now, like um, I think I'm okay at translating um, research and, and stuff to, to people, to athletes, to coaches, to colleagues or peers, and hopefully to like general population. So we just started doing that but um yeah hopefully i'd love if people interact and like you know question what i'm putting out and stuff but hopefully it's a, at least some sort of source of like okay like reasonable interpretation of the science that can hopefully improve whether that's like health or performance um and without maybe some of the like drastic views on tiny things that don't matter like it's <laughs> yeah. trying to focus on yeah. just focus on the yeah, important yeah. things you can actually make a difference yeah, with yeah. and and um, yeah, just, I guess, like figure it out as I go along. I don't know if I have a, a grand master plan of anything, but i um, definitely happy to like answer questions or people are like, oh, would you do what do you know about this? Like, I'd love to summarize something else. Because at yeah. the moment, I'm just thinking about what, you know, what comes to mind, really. Yeah, no, I think I think your work is very good. I think it's I think it's very um, it's very nice. And like um, I'm just looking here at some of your stuff that you post and not all of it is developed by yourself. Obviously, you post up some other stuff. But I re- actually, just a couple of ones before I wrap up today. One I did like was uh, Amara's Law for Health Behaviors, which I hadn't seen before, yeah. and you put it up. Yeah. And initially, when I saw the graph, it, I thought, oh, Dunning, is this Dunning Kruger curve again coming up? But it was this kind of on the y axis, you got benefit, and on the um, x axis, you have time. And it's basically about like people's expectations over time, actual mm-hmm. benefit, and how they underestimate the long term benefit as well. And how people overestimate the short-term benefit. And when I read, when I saw this, I actually giggled because I thought to myself, it's like the guy or the girl that goes on a on a diet on Monday, and then they're weighing themselves at Monday at twelve o'clock, going, "Why haven't I lost weight?" And then by yeah. four o'clock on Monday, it's like, oh, "This is shit. I'm just going to go back eat a bag of chips." You know, it's sort of yeah. they're not trying to do the small little incremental things every single day that are going to basically uh, develop those habits and behaviors over time. The small things which I, I saw something recently as well about, you know, goals for 2023 was like basically go low and go slow type of thing. So, you know, mm-hmm. don't set these lofty goals where you're going to gain 20 kilos, get muscle or whatever, or lose 30 kilos or run 20 yeah. marathons. Just go, I'm going to walk 10,000 steps a day because it's just those small, like even little things. And this Amara's Law was quite was quite interesting. Yeah. It really, um, yeah, it made me think a lot about different people and different things. <laughs> yeah, I think that's when you could apply it to a lot of different things. And yeah, like you said, it's just people sort of see, and like I guess it ties into what I was saying around like people see other people sharing information, like, oh, this supplement and this, like whatever, this hack and stuff. And then they they do it or they take it or they eat a certain way or perform a certain behavior, whatever it is. And then they expect this like immediate like improvement in whether that's like sleep or in health or energy or feeling and then when it doesn't come they usually stop but what happens is like that's not to say that the supplement or the behavior or the the strategy they've implemented doesn't work or isn't effective it's just they haven't done it long enough to actually see the true like benefit of it Hmm. and you even said yourself you're a you're an endurance runner or you have competed and that's like one of the clearest examples of probably like you know being patient with like training and Mm. being persistent with your behaviors. And when you accumulate not only 
all those kilometers in your training and all the recovery from that eventually you get to the point where you can perform to that like extreme i guess like level and you know if you try to do that tomorrow like in one day there's you know not a hope that anyone would, mm. would ever be able to do that but that's like a really clear example i think of of that like amara's law in in practice yeah look i've had this conversation recently with someone as well because they were asking about how because i do brazilian jiu-jitsu as well and they were like how do you get good at jiu-jitsu i said well it's not how long have you been doing it oh two years I'm like well i've been at it for 12 years like yeah so that's it and what it is is i said this is the key is coming in two to three times a week and being consistent. Not yeah. coming in and blasting yourself every day for a month because all those guys get injured. You can't sustain mm-hmm. that. You have a family, you have work and so on. It's coming in, giving yourself a range. Don't say, I have to come in four times. Say, I need to get minimum two in, mm-hmm. maximum four. So then you're giving yourself a bit of wiggle room. And I often use that like for an example of going to bed instead of saying to people, when people have no of kind of, would say, consistency in bedtime routine, Instead of saying to them, go to bed every night at 9 o'clock, I said to them, I'll start with, go to bed between 9 and 11. Mm-hmm. So it's such a wide yeah. range and you're trying to, and then you can kind of titrate those times and go, now we need to get down between the quarter to 10 and 10. So people it, then start optimizing that. Yeah, it's funny. I know we're like even at time, but we didn't even, even that's an example like of um, where some of the wearable technology, I think, I know that's like exploded over the last yeah. couple of years. And I think it is a good example when you give that to somebody who hasn't really monitored or tracked sleep and one, because the barrier for entry to collect that information is so low. Mm. And I understand like, it's not necessarily the first port of call for everybody, but sometimes people don't want another thing to do in terms of like a journal or like another, whatever else. so it's like, okay, look, wear this for a month or two months and then let's have a look at it afterwards. And it's amazing that often, like when people see the time that they go to bed, like they auto correct like a lot of like you know 70 percent of the way themselves just by seeing it's like oh geez i went to bed like i didn't even know how late it was now you see it on a wearable or a screen of your phone and like often after a couple of weeks you'll see if they're if they're motivated to they'll shift to a more consistent schedule based on just like literally really simple feedback like that so i guess that's like amara's law and practice as well but like sometimes a really simple and like you say, giving some leeway and even giving leeway in a wearable, I would say, look, wear this. Don't really pay too much attention to it for two months. We'll have a look at it in two months time. Yeah. You'll find that people sort of after a few weeks are like, oh, you know what? Actually, like I'm going to do this myself and I feel a bit better. And then like things start to, I guess, like fall in place or things click with people as well. Well, we, we actually discussed this in a recent publication that we had called Pajamas, Polysomnography and Professional Athletes, the role of sleep tracking technology in sport, where Matt Driller and myself Solid, and yeah. Amy Bender and a few others. And I don't know if you've connected with Amy. Amy, actually uh, Yeah, in- I've connected with her on, on uh, social media. Yeah, yeah, yeah. she's actually in, um, she's in Calgary um, from Washington State originally, I think. But um, so that, that's, we, we basically spoke about that in the paper about collecting like minimum, you know, 14, 28 days of data, mm-hmm. getting those behaviors. And also we want to not kind of induce orthosomnia, which is basically people getting obsessed with those measures, yeah. which I think kind of feeds a little bit into Mara's law as well, because what happens is people are like constantly jumping on and off the scale. And you see this with um, not only athletes, but shift workers wake up in the morning and go, oh, and you got six and a half hours sleep last night. I only got like 10% of REM. I supposed to get 25% of REM. Mm-hmm. Oh, now, now, now I'm done for the day. I'm, I'm, and they're freaking out. And it's like, well, what are you going to do about it? And then also yeah. as well, is understanding the limitations of those devices as well about mm-hmm. in terms of, you know, their inaccuracy or their poor reliability in tracking sleep stages. They're highly variable. Yeah. So I often say to people like, you need to look at this. And Michael Gradner has been on the podcast as well, speaking about this is you need to look at this over time particularly mm-hmm. around time at sleep onset, sleep duration, time you wake up. And let's look at the behaviors. And then you can start picking up trends, come back to our data analytics conversation about, okay, now we can see, Peter, we've collected data on you for a month. Every Saturday night, you don't go to bed at four o'clock in the morning. What was on Saturday? Yeah. Oh, that's not about my mates. And you know, we do this. Yeah, yeah. Blah, blah, blah. Yeah. So, okay. All right. So we don't want to eliminate that. But could you maybe go home maybe two hours earlier? Yeah, maybe I could try that. And then you start doing it, you know, and you start kind of titrating these things over time. And that's where I think it, I think wearables are very valuable over long term. They're very bad for people who are reacting to them on a day to day basis. <laughs> so this is, yeah, this is funny. Like whenever, if I, some, I've supported some people with like, they have wearables and I'm, I've supported them with like interpretation and stuff like that as well. Yeah. And one of the first things 
I do is like when they show me, for example, like, oh, like here's my last night's sleep or like my last night's heart rate. I'm like, okay, like you're in today's view. The first thing I do is like click the weekly view and then click the monthly view. Yeah, yeah. And now, okay, this is this is what you should be looking at. And do this, you know, even you don't even have to look at it every day, but like just that's the sort of like thing that I would always say to you is like, yeah, like zoom in a little bit, look for like the trend. So if over the last two months, your heart rate is higher than normal okay maybe there's something you need to have a think about there mm. but if it's higher after one night or two nights then like may you know like maybe that's not a big deal same with sleep if you miss 30 minutes of sleep shorter than what you're normal tonight if that happens over two months then yeah maybe that's something you need to have a look at and have a conversation about but that's the first thing i would do with anyone is like okay like zoom out a little bit mm. don't look at today look at this week yeah look at this month and then start to make a decision if you need to change anything yeah, you gotta look at the you gotta look at the big picture. Yeah, same with weight as well. You know that's why yeah. I'm, I'm the same. Like you know, as I get older, obviously I think more about your weight. And I I give myself now a range. I'm like, I don't want to be below seventy seven kilos anymore because I feel weak when I do jujitsu. I want to feel a bit stronger. And I know that some of the research shows as you get older, like having a bit more strength and muscle mass is a bit better protective wise. And I also feel better, but I don't want to get too heavy either. So I'm like between 77, 78, up to about eighty two. And just yeah, once you got a week, some bandwidth there, bandwidth, yeah. and that allows me then, like you know, if I go away for a weekend, if I pig out for a few nights, whatever it is, and I feel a bit fat, uh, that's okay. I give myself that range because I know I feel healthy and good within that range. And so I generally yeah. like hitting like eighty to eighty one every Monday when I jump on the scales, and that's okay. And if it's eighty one point five, which it was once around Christmas, I went right time to rein it in, my friend. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Now, yeah. now I can. I mean, bring, I bring it in. I, I've carb loaded for you know half marathon, and you know I've put on. I think over a kilo and I, but I know it's like, you know, I weigh myself in the context of like, well, this is the, that means I've actually carb loaded properly. And I'm my like glycogen sores are actually if, like appropriate for what I'm about yeah. to do today. And so like, you know, there's always that, like we said before, like once you understand what you're doing and stuff and you have the, the context behind it, then yeah. you sort of understand things a little bit better. There's always context. It's like what we do some stuff. I've done some research in um, martial artists when they're cutting weight for fights with Reed Reel. And same thing as well. Pe people think that fighters are walking around just, you know, like 6-7% body fat. They're just getting to that kind of thing just for a very specific time to weigh in and then they're back up. And when you see a fighter out of camp not training or in not in training camp for a fight within that last six weeks, they just look like a normal guy. Like they're like between 12 to 20% body fat. And you're like, oh, actually they look quite different. You yeah, know, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you know, some yeah. Irish walk around like ripped the whole of them from a picture on the screen. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Anyway, Peter, there's probably loads of rabbit holes we can go down here. If people want to follow you um, on social media, they want to connect with you, they've got any questions, they want to find out any more of your work or look at your publications, how can people get a hold of you? What's the best handle? Um, yeah, my handles on uh, social media are Dr. Peter Tierney, despite not wanting to be called that. Um, because I <laughs> couldn't have I think Peter Tierney wasn't available. Um, but yeah, I like if anyone sends me a message on LinkedIn or Twitter or on Instagram, um, I will always reply. It might take me a bit of time if I'm busy in work and and in life or from away, but I will always get back to somebody. Um, so I'd love if somebody did uh yeah, interact and like I said, I get a lot from from learning from other people uh, on those platforms so find them find them very useful well peter it's been great to meet you today and a great conversation really thank you for your time and um yeah i'm sure we'll talk soon yeah great to chat thanks for thanks for uh inviting me on